Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast here with Benji as always. This show is supported by our show partner, LaCole, who produced performance cycling apparel, a topic and topics we do not often get to throughout the year. We provide our opinions here and there on Young Talent. This is the Neo Pros podcast, but we'll be a bit lax with that definition. We'll talk about sort of a lot of U23 talent outside the likes of the names you normally hear, like a Pagatra, Almeida, Avon Paul, et cetera, some Guys joining teams in World Tour Pro Conti next year, guys who had their first full year of racing this year. And uh, yeah, we'll maybe stretch that definition a little bit. For example, Bissiger, trainee last year, but first full year this year, or Hater, only 15 days last year for, for Ineos. But the first question will be a recap, Benji, which I think we got pretty similar answers, but we'll wait to see who were the top Neo Pros in 2021. There's obviously the likes of Peacock, Bissiga, Hater, uh, Jake Stewart, but there's some other names as well. I'm sure I'm missing some. Yes, I've got a, a list of six riders that popped into my head instantly. And quite a few of the ones you named are in that. We've got Tom Pitcock, of course. He uh, technically won Amstel in our heads, but actually won Brabant's appeal in real life <laughs> and has decent results throughout the year as well. And... Obviously, hunting for that mountain bike gold medal does have a consequence to his Velta, for example, but he still had wonderful results for a rider that just signed for a, a World Tour team. And perhaps we were expecting it, knowing where he came from and what talent he had on the side across already. The next to that, I also have Bissiger, like you mentioned, as a nail pro because, well... He's had some decent time trials this year. He's won time trials this year. And if you win time trials this year, then you deserve to be on that list in my eyes. And the ones he won are, for example, in Paris, Tour de Suisse, in uh, Benelux Tour as well. So that's three World Tour race ITTs that he's winning in a single year right here in his first proper year as a World Tour cyclist. So that is definitely deserving of that. I don't, I'm not sure podium, but at least my top six of riders. I've got a rider that people often skip when thinking about this list because he's only really had one day in the year where he was outstanding, and it's Mauro Schmidt. He won the Giro stage, and he was a Neo Pro at Quebec, and he's going to be a rider that people will skip on their list of Neo Pros because, well, he had that one result, but he's signing for the Koenig next year, and I'm I'm seeing stuff happening there. Well, we should say quick step because the Koenig's leaving the sport. And obviously, the likes of a hater, like you mentioned, a question for you. I don't have Hater in my podium for the sole reason that he performed very well consistently throughout the season, but has not reached a World Tour race standard yet of like uh, at the top level of cycling, you know? I have Hater above someone like Schmidt. I'd rather take mm -hmm. Hater's results than the one, I know it's blasphemous, but like Hater is the, the number of top threes or top fives he has across top pro competition Outrageous. which it's incredible consistency across a variety of parkour and you know tour of britain yes top pro race but van art was there in what he said was better form than he even was at world championships ala philippe was there he won two no sorry he won one stage one of the team time trial but he was top 10 he was top 10 in every stage but one where he came 11th on the last stage out of eight so yeah, he's really good, and I rate that a little bit more than mm -hmm. the one win, especially Schmidt was from a break in Montalcino stage. Great performance, but yeah, it's just... You're right. Whereas Bissiger, that Benelux Tour TT, that's World Tour, as Benji said, three World Tour stage wins. It is hard to win a World Tour time trial in 2021, so that's really impressive to me. I, I have him ab above Hater, but my list is Pitcock. Uh, it's tough because Pitcock doesn't have the wins, but he was racing the biggest races and yep. was already a top classics rider. So, yes, the results aren't there, but six, six at World Champs, first at Ribbons of Pale, sixth at Flesh, second at Amstel. These are fifth at Strata, third Kerner, attacking in the descent of the Poggio. I have Pitcock first just in terms of level and then Agreed. Bissiger, Hater. Is that what's your podium i had pitcock in, pitcock in first and i've got like five riders somewhere around there <laughs> as in i hadn't specified a second and third spot but if i had to i would be placing bissiger in second because of those three world tour wins and i personally had schmidt a buff hater because the Giro win 
the result is bigger than the wins that Hater has done. But I understand that when it comes to performance and how strong Hater was, I'd sign Hater over Schmidt any day right now. Yeah, like, yeah. So definitely for the same money. And depending on what the budget is, I'd pay more for Hater than uh, for Schmidt as a rider. But next to those riders, let's think about Florian Vermeer. This guy, we've spoken about him quite a few times before he popped up his head in uh, Roubaix and coming second there. That's also uh, an outstanding Benji. result for a Neil Pro, mate. What? His name never left my lips before Roubaix. No, that's not true. <laughs> I never mentioned this guy's name. I didn't know he existed. I you don't did. believe you. <laughs> you knew he existed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Next to that, Olaf Koy. Where do you think he stands this year? Because he's also much younger than the other ones in our list. So is that something we need to take into consideration when making this list? Definitely. He was 19. He was a teenager for the entirety of his races this year. He just turned 20. He, he did do mainly a circuit that the Jumbo Visma dev team does half the time, like Croatia race, Tour de Hungary, and then I think his best results were like, I'm not disappointed in Koi, but I was coming into the year, I was really, really high on him, like v- hyping him up a lot. Too high? Yeah, I probably, no, yeah, he didn't He didn't match the hype I was saying. Like I, I thought he would be like beating Germay in that sort of uphill sprint and probably doing, I mean, he came second in a Tour de Polonia World Tour sprint by Niaviri. It was fine. It was, it was still really encouraging. I just I was really really high on him, but it's all it's all fine. But yeah, he just didn't do enough for me, particularly in top competition, to be. Wait, like, he's nineteen. Come on. <laughs> no, no, I mean like to be mentioned alongside Pitcock, yeah, Pizzago, I get it. Hater. Um, yeah, certainly. What about next year? Decker, Coy, Groenewegen. Obviously, Tour is is the big guns. Giro, who are you taking? Who Groenewegen to the to the Giro? I think. And yeah. to the tour, neither of them go to the tour in my eyes, yeah. simply because of the idea that they cool don't Decker. fit in the tour squad. <laughs> and yeah, Decker has an issue in that aspect because he's being forced in a lead out position in the Giro last year. Well, this year, technically. And I was high on a stage win from him and that didn't happen as a consequence. And yeah, I don't know what his path is going to be offering. I'm expecting him to perhaps lead more into the uh, one day Belgian classics the more sprinty ones, a Monserrat, for example, to perhaps have opportunities. But then again, Olaf Koy can do so as well. So then the question is, where do you divide those two? So they've got a lot of thinking to do in that team, and it doesn't help that they uh, want to win Grand Tours because uh, then you don't have much space for sprinters in Grand Tours. Do you think that they could send one to the Vuelta somehow? I mean, Groenewegen normally it's something he'd, he'd send him to. Uh, there's probably lots of no. Nah, there's a lot of like Benelux sort of races there around that time as well. I don't know. Decker seems to be the he was a neo pro this year as well. He came in start of the year, and me and you were getting so hyped with two seconds, one in, one in a full sprint stage behind Bennett. We were like, holy, this this guy is legit. But then not too many results after that although you know he went to the Giro as a as a lead out man so it's hard to say with Decker it's it's a fine balancing act they have with two young sprinters and a premium sprinter Dylan Kronovec and at Jumbo Visma but yeah they were our Neo pros of the year I would say the best Neo pro performance of the year probably probably Pidcock at Brabantse Pale or or uh, like against Trenton or at Amstel Gold Race, I guess was pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, I have to say, but he's been riding like everyone knows Tom Pickoff for a while. You almost forget he's a neo pro. Before we get into our next question, just want to mention our show partner Lacole, who produced performance cycling apparel. Winter is coming. In fact, it's already pretty much here, and they've got you covered with technical apparel to keep you warm during winter. You can check them out at www.lacol. Dot .cc I was actually wearing the kit the other day in it's like minus 2 in Andorra it was pretty unpleasant but it was the first time I realized I can actually ride in conditions that low so thanks to Lacol for supporting the podcast that's www.lacol.cc which current neo pros and we've already probably touched on this Benji which current ones do you think are going to really kick on next year and, and surprise us? Well, you mentioned Decker and I was like, oh, I don't know where it's going to fit in. Who are the guys who've got opportunities? And you think, is it Mauro Schmidt going from Quebec at a quick step 
is he going to blossom straight away into like someone like Mikel Honore? I don't know how they will decide when he gets an opportunity at Quick Step because we know that he's gotten over that break stage win at the Giro over Montalcino, Sandy sections and so forth. But does that make you a rider that can get into the team of Strade already at Quick Step? I would dare to say not yet. And I'd need to see more beforehand to be able to give that position to a rider like Mauro Schmidt. And that is also looking into classic races and so forth, because that's where I currently see him more. The classics and hilly parkours more than anything else, really. Do you see that the same or you have a different idea? Um, It's weird because he really doesn't have many results outside yeah. of that. Like it's that one stage. And honestly... I'm going to shit on the Giro a little bit like that. Some of those breaks were not top level when you Didn't the Lotto to- rider crash from Hooker that day? Um, from that breakaway remember. when they were three, I think <laughs> one of them crashed and then Kobe <laughs> was left. But then again, beating Kobe is quite kind of big on a stage like that. Kobe's all right, Kobe. He came on a little bit more consistent than, than Schmidt then at the end of the year. But yeah, like looking at some of the other hilly races you're mentioning, like Giro de Emilia DNF, Torino DNF, Lombardia DNF, Britannia Classic 72nd, uh, Denmark DNF. I'm not sure what happened there. Tour of Britain not competitive in any of those finishes. And he's a young guy, of course. Like, But I'm just saying I you I agree with what you're saying, Benji. Like Making that Strade team, Stibar, Alaphilippe, Van Sevenant, and Co- like it's stacked. Or Dries Stevener. So you've got to be pretty good to make the quick, the quick step alpha vinyl uh, Strada <laughs> Bianca team. So, yeah, maybe I'm not expecting huge things from him uh, next year, actually. I'm expecting Pidcock to be to be top again. Frankly, I just think he'll... We uh, spoke about Kovi, and there's a lot of riders in that team, of course, that are pretty young as well. Uh, Felix Grosch and so forth. But obviously, we've spoken a lot about Juan Ayuso, but... He's so far had opportunities in like Italian classics and so forth. Preba Villafranca as well in Spain as well. And then we've got the likes of his Giro U23 also in the uh, last year. I do expect a lot from this guy. I've been very high on him for a while now. I think a lot of people have. And I do think that next year will be the year that they might send him to his first Vuelta, actually. Yeah, that would make sense. He's Spanish and why not? Like, why not there? He exactly. He can get around the welter, I think. Um, like Seb did the welter this year. Seb Berwick is a his Neo Pro year, and it's just good to get that one that one out of the way. Um, but yeah, I think Abner Gonzalez, the guy I thought was, <laughs> I roasted at the start of the year, I actually think he could be pretty good next year as well as Ina Rubio. Um, I'm not sure if they're technically Neo Pros at, at Movistar. Betrago, I expect a lot from, but I'm not sure where he fits in Bahrain's plans. There's Andres Krohn. Is he a Neo Pro? Yeah, he uh, is. He is. He is. Yeah, he's a, well, I'm not counting Rival. Uh, he's well too a Neo Pro. <laughs> not counting Rival. Sorry, Rival. Um, yeah, he won a stage at Catalonia, won a stage at Tour de Suisse. He never gets mentioned, Benji. Fifth at the Trey Valley of Aracena, and he, he rarely gets mentioned. I think well, he's. To be fair, we mentioned him for every hill stage in the Grand Tour, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Uh, and he didn't He didn't deliver for us. Uh, Ida Schelling, obviously, Neo Pro. He won that Swiss race and was in Polkadot for a week at the Tour de France, which was great. Uh, Clément Champesin, I think, is a Neo Pro. And he won, obviously, the, the Vuelta stage. Jordi Mayus for Bora Hansgrohe. Where do you see him fitting in, Benji? Because they had him. He had good results at the end of the year. Third at Cook Chappelle, second at Grand Prix de Denain, second at Eurometropole, one Paris Bourge at the lower level competition. But I don't see him as being competitive in World Tour sprints against decent guys, and I'm not sure he's the best lead-out man either. Me neither yet, but I feel like he's the kind of rider that you test out in the Tour de Polonia, for example, in the same way that Bora did with Ackermann in his early years. I do feel like Mayo seems to be situated more on the not pure sprinter, but the outsider sprinter with some cobble capabilities or some versatility to it. I at least have that feeling at the moment, and perhaps that will change over the course of the next year but it's a team with many of those riders Matthew Walls he's uh won a race pretty recently this year as well and he's certainly a rider that I also see getting better in the coming years so they're gonna have to make quite a few decisions they've got a pure sprinter in Sam Bennett in that team so it's not going to be super easy to uh give every rider in that team an opportunity when it comes to sprints but I think Mayo's opportunity lie in perhaps Bennett 
going to the tour and then Mayus or a rider alike gets to go to the Vuelta for the sprint, something like that. But then again, if you've got Bennett, why not send them to the Vuelta as well, you know? Exactly. I mean, oh, there's Benelux and things like that, I guess, but they have other sort of Asgren options there. Marty van Sevenon on quick step, speaking of young Belgians, like 22. This was his first year of World Tour racing. One, actually, a race in his like third race, GP Industri and Artigian di Donato, and a third at Trofeo Laguelia. Didn't do Milano San Remo. Would you want him, Benji, on Poggio? I think he could do a hard lead out for Alaphilippe. He reminds you of he can do the pool three Steven Irons has sometimes done. I'm surprised he didn't go to MSR. Um, do you expect him to be winning races next year? I don't see him I don't see him beating like like if, if they have a an uphill finish like Giro Stage One, for example, I want Bagioli there if I'm quick step, or assuming Alaphilippe's not there. I think Bagioli's got the punch. He doesn't have the pure climbing to win climbing stages. He's more, uh, yeah, like a, a sort of guy that can win GP Industria, and that was a sprint, I think, against um, – the, the, it was against Mola Melanda and Quintana. Um, where do you see his role next year for quick step? Will there be more opportunities or will he become like a premium domestique in World Tour races for Alaphilippe? Well, he's already shown that he's got a perfect ability in Italian classics with the races you mentioned already. We've seen him only once or twice in the uh, latter part because I don't know what happened at Emilia, but he didn't finish that race. Got 19th in Torino, though, on a Superga climb. So that's a pretty strong performance. The thing with Von Sevenant I like and something that I'm not sure Quick Step will 100% give him is I would like riders from that age with that kind of ability to go for stage runs and ground tours before they try anything random. I don't think his time trial is uh, on the level to be considered a GC prospect. But then again, his Bilbao, TT, and Itzulia was decent. But then again, that was quite hilly. So perhaps that is not really defining his flat ITT capabilities. I don't see him as a GC prospect. I see him as a rider that could do hilly classics quite well. I'm looking forward to seeing him again in uh, the likes of Amstel, Flesh, and Liege. I recall him attacking in either Amstel or Liege at some point and flying through a group. I don't know when that happened or what, but it looked cool, so I'm calling it out right here. And yeah, I want them to go for stage wins at a, at a Grand Tour. But the problem is they've got Remco in the team. Gave, they've got the likes of a Elon Van Wilder joining, and that's most recent news going away from DSM to this team. And all these riders combined, are they going to try and get these three to go to the Vuelta and support Evenepoel in that way? I'd rather see Van Sevenon go for stage wins in the Giro or something instead. I think Van Sevenon's better than Van Wilder, personally. Yeah, but I like him. I think Van Wilder's time trial's much better. And as a consequence, he's got more of an opportunity to do one week GCs than Van Sevenon's can. Van Wilder is climbing, not look that good, but he obviously wasn't happy at DSM. Uh, Gurmai is, I guess, by my definition, technically his first full year of world tour level racing, or not even full year. He moved to Intermarche midway through the year. He's 17th in the under-23 rankings. I'm looking forward to, I've already said, he should go to the Giro next year and try and take the Malia Rosa <laughs> on stage one. I think he can definitely top five that stage, depending on the competition, although Bala's going. Two young climbers that have flown under the radar. One has decent results is Giovanni Aliotti on Italian on Bora. He's signed till t- end of 2023. He won Sibiu Tour, which Sosa and Bernal have won. And uh, Pronsky, a young Kazakh on Astana who actually was really good in the Giro and was stronger than Vlasov on some of the climbs in the third week from memory, but he had to ride as a domestic for Vlasov. I think that guy can win a a stage Fortunato style uh, from the break in the Giro next year, uh, Pronsky. He's really good. But there, that's just a rapid fire overview of the, the Neo Pros and what we expect from some of them next year. Quinn Simmons, I think. One more. Oh, yeah. One more. Okay. You said Simmons, but I wanted to throw in uh, Roger Adria. He's currently riding for, uh, uh, oh, God. I've completely forgot the name of the team. Oh, no. The team of Kiko Galvan as well. The green jersey. Equipo Karen Farmer. Yes, Karen Farmer. <laughs> He's a rider that I think is very promising. He didn't ride the most intelligent race at Party Tour, but he rode 19th there, which is crazy because I saw this guy as a climbing prospect. And he's he's got very versatile results for someone that I thought was a climber. And I don't know. I don't know what to expect from him. I think Italian classics or 
he was also good. He got third in that same Priva Villafranca race that Ayuso podiumed, the one Luis Leon Sanchez won, and where this race happened just after the uh, stuff with are you control, uh, trash on the ground, or you get a fine and so forth, and then people try to get Luis Leon Sanchez to, to get thrown out of this race despite winning it because of that. So, yeah, that's why I remember this race so uh, so vividly. But Ayuso and Adria podiumed that both, and... I think they've both got talent, and I think the benefit of someone like Adria is that those riders can grow in the shadow of Ayuso's hype, because Ayuso's the top hype when it comes to Spanish riders. Even Carlos Rodriguez is not hyped as much as Ayuso, I feel like. No. He, the Andrew is kind of like Matteo Jorgensen, Benji. I'm like, I thought you were a climber. Mm-hmm. And then he does this punchy thing on yeah. like a classic star stage or like he came second in a Tour of Britain stage. He, it's hard to categorize him. Even like Nielsen Powers at the World Champs, I was like, hold up. Uh, he's not a Neo Pro, obviously. But now on to the name some of you might not have heard about, which is the Neo Pros we're most looking forward to next year, or not most looking forward to, but like the list of top Neo Pros who've been signed to mostly World Tour teams. Do you want to run through the headline ones, Benji? Okay, I will for you. So we've got quite a few ones that are going to World Tour teams. Then we're looking at the likes of a Plap, a Hajduk, a Vernon Eitebrooks, Zvercek, or however you know, pronounce that guy that is going to a quick step, the uh, Slovakian. So we've got a new Slovakian in World Tour, which is a crazy thing to think about because so far that has been mainly Sagans. And then we've got Arnaud Dali also joining a World Tour team, Jan Maas, Marius Meyerhofer, Helemos, Baroncini, Dan Hole, Van Trecht, Sheffield, Healy, Osborne, kinda. He was already part of quick step though, so perhaps it's not really deciding that we are looking at here, Marijn van den Berg, Steinhauser, a guy you've been talking about before, Leitao, he's going to a pro county team, and the same counts for uh, one of the riders I'm very hyped about, that is moving up in teams, which is Tobias Haaland johannesson He's a... Uh, I'll start off with him, because why not? I've got the reins in my hands right now, so I'll use it. Tobias Haaland johannesson rider that rode uh, for UNOX Dare development team, which is basically the dev team of the pro county team UNOX. And he's very bloody talented. Won the Tour de l'Avenir, the uh, Tour of the Future, that is translated in English, if you're in French, is not really amazing. And uh, he did that just ahead of Carlos Rodriguez, Filippo Zana. Carlos Rodriguez, rider of Ineos, Zana, rider of Bardiani. And both of those can climb very well. And Johannesson was absolutely dominant in the majority of the race, except for the last one, at which Carlos Rodriguez came back. But this is a really good climber. And... Really decent at Hill Race as well, podium LBL U23. And I think he got podium as well at the Giro U23 behind the Uso, but I'm not 100% sure. Yes, yes. that's correct. So uh, I'm very high on this guy. What's your take on him? I'm a bit cautious about the 22 year old Norwegians now. <laughs> Tobias Can- Foss? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, you know, like <laughs> Foss is good, don't get me wrong, but you much rather have a guy who comes in first year U23, 19 years old cleans up Avenir, you're like, you know, like, well, Pag- I'm not sure what age Pagacha was when he won it, but he was younger than 22, that's for sure. He's he was winning his second Tour de France at 2022. So, yeah, I mean, the question is, okay, is this other Sc- Scandinavian like this, is he a later developer? Or has he been training in almost a professional way with good support for a number of years and then he's more developed at, 20, 20, at t- 22 years old? Compared to a Carlos Rodriguez or a Ayuso, uh, who he's competing against, who are maybe a couple of years younger than him, and on that large last stage, uh, Steinhauser and uh, I think Carlos Rodriguez just destroyed him. And Steinhauser is twenty, so he's about two years younger as well. So, yeah, I'm a little bit cautious. I don't expect him to be. I mean, it's interesting, Benji. Three years at you know X. Like they're building something like he like pro Conti level. He's gonna be twenty five. Yeah, he's gonna be twenty five. I mean, that didn't stop Hulgard at twenty six, twenty seven getting a, the Trek deal. So that's that's fine from that aspect. It's just he obviously got a decent offer. Like I, I'd imagine some world to <laughs> be some world tour teams that would have wanted Johannesson. What would happen if a rider from Uno X, if they're invited to a one week world tour race, for example, and Johannesson absolutely destroys top climbers? It's unlikely, but what if an occasion like that happens with a World Tour race, a Grand Tour, suddenly be interested the next year to get that team 
on the start list? Or do you think that him being Norwegian is stopping that because it's not a French, Spanish or Italian writer in that aspect? Well, yeah, did, I'm not sure. I, do they do any world tour one-week races? I mean, they sometimes struggle for invites. They get easy invites to a lot of the One Pro classics. Um and they, they, were, they were so exciting at those races. But obviously, Tour of Norway and stuff they did. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe it'll be a difficult program for him at Uno X. So, but he's definitely one to watch. You know, I have to respect second at Baby Giro, first at Tour de Lavenir. The big signing, I think the marquee one is Plap at Ineos. Second at U23 Worlds ITT. He was stronger than Port at the Santos Festival of Cycling on Willunga Hill. He could have dropped Port, but he, I think they were on the same team, or he he, he let Port Port win the stage. Uh, he's twenty, just about to turn twenty one. He looks like to me Thomas two point in terms of GC prospect. He has the TT, the track background. Just went to the Olympics, same sort of height, just on about six foot five eleven about 70 kilos once or 71, 72 once he drops off some track weight, I think, and he's just a really exciting prospect. And Australian, I can't remember what Australian national, he came fifth at the Australian National Champs U23 uh, last year, 17th this year. But, yeah, I think he will surprise people by how good he is next year. I think so as well. He's uh, definitely a strong rider in his ITT at the U23 Champs. World Champs is one that I see very highly because he's not riding against bloody pancakes in that race. He's riding against decent ITT U23 riders. Prisa Peterson, yes, he certainly is uh, the older version there, but the riders behind them is uh, also young talent that is trying to get as high as possible. And him getting second is a lot. And I do think that Ineos is a good place for him to try and bolster that ability as well. And perhaps start getting opportunities somewhere. I don't know how a team like Ineos keeps finding opportunities, though, to get everybody uh, a certain opportunity because we look at the likes of Carlos Rodriguez and he's kind of been from Burgos now to going to Provence and perhaps next year we will see his first Grand Tour. Perhaps for Plav that will also be a pathway where he has to do, I don't know, a year and then the second year or the third year he starts his first Grand Tour as well, depending on the results he does, of course, because... uh, Well, it's a stacked team and the consequences are that it's very difficult to move up in the rankings unless you perform. And one of those other riders that I'm also very much looking forward to what they do in World Tour is not one on Ineos. It's a rider on Trek Segafredo and everybody might know him because he won the U23 World Championships. Filippo Baroncini, he uh, also won the Giro U23 ITT. So next to being decent, in what it seems like Italian classic style races, hilly classics in that aspect. He's also a damn good T-tier from on that level at least. And um, yeah, if I look at these guys' results, I said it, Italian classics all out. And he showed that in the Coppa Sabatini, the race won by Valgren before the World Championships that hyped Valgren up to try and win the World Championships. And he did that ahead of the likes of Paulus, Moscon, Corvi. So those are riders in World Tour that are good damn riders and if you can beat those on a parkour that is quite hilly then uh you can definitely deserve a spot in world tour and uh i'm looking forward to see where they send him i hope they send him to the italian classics i hope that he gets opportunities much on that type of parkour i don't know what other stuff i would send them to directly though but i uh, i'm looking forward to see what he can do but A rider that you're pretty hyped on, right, is uh, Steinhauser. You've spoken about him quite a few times. What's your take on him? Good climber, going to the right team for it, to stage hunt, going to EF, 20 years old. I think he's a really good profile. I think him, Paulus, Carr and co, just they're building a good roster of those sort of stage hunting guys in Giro and and Vuelta. And Baroncini, just a note on him, I think he's Trek's best signing. I, I really don't like most of their signings. I think he's the the one that really shines and stands out as as a good one. But yeah, Steinhauser, second behind Carlos Rodriguez in the, I think it might have been the Queen stage of the Tour de Lavenir. And um, I think yeah. he won Bulgaria, Tour GC. He's good. And uh, yeah, I think fan of the pod as well. Uh, what do you think channel. about EF being the team that he goes to? Do you think that he'll find a way to get opportunities there? It seems that way at EF. Like Simon Carr this year, 
He was, if you don't count Nippo Delco last year, um, which he sort of joined halfway through, he got plenty of opportunities at the right sort yeah. of races, like Tour de Zalp, Maritima du Var, Tirreno, he did the Giro, he, uh, then he DNF the Welt. Jeez, he had a pretty heavy year for a, a new Yeah, he did crazy. <laughs> uh, Ruto Occitani, where I think caught on a stage. So, yeah, he should. And also Classica San Sebastian, where he was – important for Paulus, those two actually when he was up the road so yeah i think i'm not too concerned about him and another one going to ef as well from trinity the irishman ben healy which kind of surprising like you'd think okay trinity irish or irish or british riders on trinity ineos is normally the one and he's going to ef and i don't know if that has i don't think he shares an agent with ben with uh eddie dunbar but you look at eddie dunbar at ineos not had opportunities galore, although I think he has performed pretty well at times. Yeah, one grand tour in his time at Ineos is year in 2019. Maybe people are thinking Ineos as Benji, you know, you just mentioned it, Benji. Where is Plap going to get the opportunities when you got Rodriguez, etc.? Maybe Ineos is too stacked to shine as a neo pro, and that's why EF, who aren't they don't have four different guys who are top 10 GC riders. Um, it's sort of Uran at the Tour who does his own thing and Aguita's left. EF is seen as a competent team where you can get some opportunities in World Tour racing. Would If you were an agent, is that the sort of thing you'd be thinking and or what other teams would be on your list? Because like, Bora, I wouldn't have up there with EF either. Yeah, I agree. And the thing when I think about a career of a cyclist is that in the early part of a career, I would be hunting for performances and victories and so forth in the hopes of gaining more financial, uh, well, being able to get more money throughout the end of your career. So yeah. for example, in the years from 20 to 25, I'd look for teams that offer opportunities for me. And from 25 to 35, depending on how good I am at 25, if I feel like I'm falling off already, I might start looking for the money. And if I've still got performances in me, I might try a few more years to look for a team with performances offered to me. But once I get to 28, 29, I'm like, Let's try and secure the bag here because I, I'm going to have kids pretty soon, okay? <laughs> Mate, they have, they have about three kids by 28, half these guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and another one is like like Jay Vine. Like I was surprised World Tour team, speaking of another guy, signing Jan Maas signed at 25 to Bike Exchange. Is he, what is he, Dutch? He's been like a grinder. He's been riding for Leopard at Conti level for a number of years. I don't see the upside there. It's just really surprising seeing some of the teams like Bike Exchange ignoring an Australian who is had a talented Neo Pro year, Vine, second GC at Turkey, obviously good at the Vuelta bar, the crashes, consistently getting in breaks. And then signing Jan Mas, who maybe he'll surprise me, but I just don't see him as, as being capable yeah. of winning World Tour st- or Grand Tour stages. I feel like it's a similar transfer. It's not a Neo Pro, but Abad Asturi going to Trek is a rider that has also grinded a lot in Conti sprints and perhaps even pro Conti sprints getting podiums and so forth. But I've got the feeling that Trek Segafredo having Abad Asturi is not something that is the most crazy uh, transfer. It's also a performance, uh, a transfer I'm like he sucks, pretty dude. down on. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> Like, but uh, I get where you're coming from. <laughs> 32 coming fourth in in crow race sprints behind Coy, Einhorn, <laughs> and Groves. Like, how the fuck is this guy getting a world tour contract for, for two years? Like, yeah. yeah, that's my view on it. <laughs> I I kind of agree. I I love Abarastuni in races. We've spoken about him quite a few times in our Slovenia pots uh this year and i just don't see it for a world tour contract and then i see riders that also are neo pros because i'm going to throw you a question you didn't prep we've got the likes of a i don't know the leon Hajduk, for example going to a world tour team these are promising riders they've got county level sprints on their uh palmares and so forth but sometimes these riders are 18 19 at the moment when they transfer to World Tour and they don't have the races yet that prove that they deserve a World Tour contract. Do you think that going to World Tour too quickly 
can have a negative influence on your career? Well, I mean, you look at Ian Garrison, right? At at, at Quickstep, he's gone back to America. So maybe, I don't know. It depends how, like, there's this phrase from American sports, like, is he NBA ready? Can, <laughs> can he, is he ready to actually play in the NBA or is he just dominating people physically inferior to him in college? But then you look, I don't know. I, I'm not really an expert on like the actual physiological stuff and how do you project how a 21 year old like Kim Heiduk who's going to Ineos who's I don't even know what sort of he's he's one stage is it he's a day and gold like uh okay rider how do you how do you know how they'll progress and then they're on a two-year deal apparently it's like by the time he's good you're having to re-sign him again or he might has a chance to leave he's German he might go to Bora Hansgrohe they might pony up a lot of cash so you're kind of developing him at Ineos, at World Tour level, now maybe you got him there and he'll stay, but yeah, it's kind of, it feels like he, unless he's going to surprise me, which I doubt, he's not going to be cleaning up or super high level in World Tour Classics next year. Uh, so wouldn't it be better for him to be at dev teams or a pro Conti team? Is kind of what you're saying. And I think, yes, but who who are the teams? Like which team would you send them to, Benji? Like a... Uh, Beat pro cycling, probably that's, too, that's not good enough. You, I don't know. I don't know what teams. Are there pro Conti teams you could send them to? I don't know. Uh, are there pro con If if anyone else is interested in a guy like Hajduk, some pro Conti team is going to be interesting in a guy like Hajduk, I would expect. But then in comparison, let's talk about also a young rider that's going to uh, World to Renam, looking at the likes of an Eiterbrooks, for example. And he's a rider that is going very young. 18 years old to World Tour directly. Now, he's had his year in the Bora prep team. I don't remember the actual name of that prep team, but they've got this kind of juniors team that they have a lot of uh, their youngsters on and then they push them through to their uh, their World Tour team as a consequence. Now, he's apparently going to be starting early on in the season, San Juan or something, uh, Iterbrooks for that team. A year and a half ago, he was declared the new Remco Evenepoel. Not even joking. <laughs> When he started winning uh, races last season, I think Kuna Brussel Kuna Juniors, he actually won. And um, winning junior races, skipping U23, that's when the question arises for me, is that a bad decision? And I think for some, it's going to end up being a, bad, being a bad decision. I can't tell you if it's going to be the same for Arthur Brooks. He was very strong at the World Champs Men's Juniors. You don't see it on the road race uh, result, but he was really strong. He had an accident, a crash or something at the start, and he ended up chasing for the entire day, never gave up, and decided not to give up. And I think, I don't know how many kilometers, but I wouldn't dare to say it It was less than uh, 50 kilometers or something. It was a lot of chasing where he just kept on chasing the entire day, and nobody took over. He just kept on pacing that entire group the entire day. Is it clever to keep on riding? I think it was for his pride in the Belgium world champs, but... That kind of stuff, the mentality of that does shine true. And I'm looking forward to what he can do, but I'm also vigilant in the aspect that I don't want him to get the media pressure that Evenepoel has been feeling the last couple of years because for Evenepoel, it has led to uh, some things, in my opinion, as a consequence. He'll be 21 when his contract finishes with Bora. Three-year deal. He's 18, yeah. turning 19 in, in February. I think... This could be a reaction to Brenner being poached, Benji. Brenner was on a Bora quote-unquote de yeah. dev team. DSM loaded him up with a uh, pretty, uh, almost an unheard of contract at the time, a four-year deal when he was 18 and he was on DSM this year. And I think this is maybe... Uh, does it matter? He's going to leave in two years from DSM anyway without exactly. the contract being done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> maybe Bora were like, we're not having that happen again. Let's lock him up. I think the risk is people see... Say a guy say a guy from 18 to 21, shock horror doesn't get fantastic results in World Tour level, even if they're talented, yeah. um, which <laughs> you got to be pretty good to get results at World Tour level at that age. Um, is there a risk long term that other world tour teams will be like, well, we we've seen this guy, you know, he's twenty three now or twenty four now. We've seen him. He's been at world tour level for four years and he's not done anything. And it's like, well, maybe the development pathway for him is a bit later. Um, and there are some riders like, like look at Hulgard, Benji. Hulgard's the exact point you're kind of you're making. 
Marcus Hulgard is fucking good. Like he's swimming at World Champs Road Race, at the Euro Champs, his his sprint bit of a he's got more of a climby sprinty boy in him than I thought. Like he's going to surely be a really good rider at Trek next year. And he signed that deal when he's twenty six, when he'd been Conti level in Norway, and then you know X for ages. So yeah. that's all the to your point. I think there's different ways to do it. I think three year deals for eighteen year olds is is surprising to me, unless they're like ridiculously dominant, which I've not seen Uta Brooks as the same level Remco was. Like Remco yeah. was winning world champs when he had a mechanical by like five minutes, like ridiculous yeah, stuff. I, uh, I agree on that aspect. And I think that's when I look at the likes of Romain Grégoire, the rider that has been beating Aita Brooks on some occasions, French rider riding from Ajazer U19 team. So Ajazer actually has a very good depth formation under them. They've got a U19 team and a U23 team. So they've got two deaf teams under their World Tour team. It's something there, that... Actually. Really? I didn't yep, even know that. Back in the day, awesome. yeah. Okay. And from this U19 team, he's now stepping over Grégoire to the U23 team. And the question then is, like with Brenner, is another team going to show up and try and poach this guy? And that's a danger when you've got a development pot lined out like this. But is there a way for a team to sign a contract with a young rider across multiple teams? As in, I want you to start your first year of your career for the U19 team. The second year, you can go to the U23 team, and we've got you secured for two more years at the World Tour level then. Uh, it's So that sort of thing is what you'd be thinking of, would just have had with Mick van Dijk, right? The Dutch, so he's a classics rider, 21. I'm really high on this guy who is going to Yumbo Visma. He was on the Yumbo Visma dev team. What I would expect, Benji, is there is you sign the, the contract with the Conti team, I mean, it's what I would do and be happy to sign if you were either the team or the agent or the rider. You go to the Conti team and then the World Tour team gets a first rider refusal to match offers you get uh, from other World Tour teams, I guess, uh, would be how it might work. I mean, he signed a three-year deal until the end of 2024 with Jumbo Visma and Mick van Dijk, who won the Flanders Tomorrow Tour. What happened with Fischer Blag then? Because one would expect that... Well, no, so so they wouldn't, they didn't want to. If, assuming that structure is in place in the contract, that means that they didn't want to match what UAE offered him. Okay, okay. So uh, that's good to know that that exists in a contract. But it might, but I'm saying that structure could exist in contracts yeah. and would make sense if it, it might not have been in there and yeah. Yumbo didn't offer him anything or he just wanted to leave and go to UAE. He's also there until 2024. He was fourth at Balois, the Belgium tour. I, I almost think Mick van Dijk might be more useful than him next year, Benji. That's my hot take is that Mick van Dijk will be better in, uh, I think van Dijk, <laughs> if he plays his cards right, if this, listen, not exactly a hard team to make, but could make Jumbo Visma's classic squad helping van Aert. Um, yep. I think he could already be doing that next year. Uh, but a team you mentioned, Azure Desert Citroën, I want to talk about another French team, and there was a tweet about this the other day. The FDJ Conti team has been churning out World Tour talent. And they, they tweeted, they said five riders got World Tour contracts, four of whom not at FDJ, which it was the guy on the Conti team tweeting it. And I was like, well, that means you're really good at your job developing these riders. I was just like, but isn't the point that they sign with with FDJ? And it's only Louis Askey, I think, who's going up the British talent um, – He'll be joining Jake Stewart in the yep. classics team. But other ones, Benji, I'm not sure how familiar you are with them, like Marin Vandenberg. Have you had a look at him? I think he's really good. And they didn't – they let him go. I think he's definitely a, a solid rider. We've heard quite a lot of him. Definitely was, uh, I think, podium at Buddy Tour de or something. But I know him mainly because of his results at the uh, Tour de l'Avenir. Again, uh, one of the biggest uh, U23 races out there, if not one of the – if not the biggest, depending if you count the World Champs race. Yeah, you do. So, I don't know. One of the biggest. <laughs> he won sprints there, ahead of the likes of Mick van Dijk, and then also uh, was in the strongest team in the TTT, although that doesn't really uh, show that you are a great individual rider, personally. But just great results all around. And I think Martin van den Berg is one of the ones I'm looking forward to, one of the most here. And he showed that as well in Conti races, the likes of uh, GP Adria Mobile. He won a light against the likes of uh, Filippo Fiorelli, for example. And I'm looking at the other riders in that Groupama FDG dev team that you spoke about, and I see 
opportunities for talent in the coming years, like Ruben Thompson. It's New Zealand all over there. You've got Jensen Plowrife. We've got Lauren Lauren Spiffy. Those are riders that also were decent in Spiffy and that GP Adra Mobile. Thompson has done, I think, decent climbing results, if my mind serves me right. Plowrife Australian, you're about to catch these hands. Oh, my God. The flag is too tiny. I can't see it, mate. I'm very sorry. But, uh, yeah, uh, I feel like that team is indeed bringing out a lot of talented riders. And I think one of the other riders that I saw was moving up, but it was apparently also to the, uh, to the what was it, Def team, uh, U23 team, is the likes of uh, Paul Penouet. He's also a fat U23 world uh, championships for example and that is only like three spots behind Louis Oski that you're talking about so this is also one of those riders that could come to world tour in the coming years as a neo pro contract same with also another rider that i'll throw in this even though this isn't really the podcast to place it but pavel bittner future sprinter czech rider definitely going to be a uh, an interesting rider to follow but we will continue with the uh programming of today and that was talking about fdg just one more note on, on them and Van den Berg. He beat Heiduk two days in a row, back-to-back days, yep. at uh, GP Orléans, maybe it's called, a Polish race. He's going to EF. I just, yeah, I don't know if they offered him a godfather offer. I doubt nah. it. I just, He's I not think family he's... with the other Van den Berg, apparently. So. Julius Van den Berg. Yeah, same team, but apparently not family, according to my sources. Fair enough. I mean, he's got his brother Lars van den Berg. He's all also on. Uh, he's on FTJ World Tour right now. Didn't know that. Uh, but yeah, I I like him, and I think he's should be pretty interesting next year. Otherwise, I think we've gone through the main ones. Benji, are the I'm interested to see Ethan Vernon at at Quick Step. So he's it's got to be the perfect team for him. He's a fast guy. He was a, a track guy. Good TT this year without maybe that much. I think he was on a weird bike as well. I think he was on that Hope Lotus bike that had been converted to the, the track bike. They've been converted to a road bike. Maybe I'm making that up. But an interesting signing for Quick Step. And they obviously have Cavendish, we assume, still there. Um, so, yeah, two-year two, two year deal for him, 21 years old. It's this is the, uh, the second part of that question. I asked it in respect to climbing and GC, Benji. You're an agent for a 22-year-old fast sprinter type rider and you're thinking about his second contract or second or third contract when he's 25, 26, getting that bag then. Is Quick Step the place you want to go to get developed so you look top class like a Gavidia Viviani, so etc.? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get what you mean. I feel like it's a, a good decision. I've mentioned already what my pathway would be if I was a rider. I would look for uh, performances first, which Quick Step can offer, I think, to a rider like Ethan Vernon, that type of rider. They've got usually the best sprinter train in the world in the majority of years that we've seen in the last few. And I think that learning from that, experiencing that is something that can help a rider like this a lot. And who knows, he might get a few victories along the way, which might up his price market, market price. That's the word I was looking for, for the next contract. And that's uh, where you can decide at 25, what am I going to do? Am I actually good? Am I going to try and find another team that goes for performances? Or am I going to try and secure the bag already at 25, which is curious because perhaps that's a bit too early. I don't know. You can go back and forth. Uh, this, this is what they do. Cavendish and Bennett and Vi- oh, Viviani didn't, but they go, they they leave Quick Step. They're like, holy fuck, it's hard to win outside of here. And then they come back to Quick Step. <laughs> and then they get a couple of results and then leave again for, for more money. It's like a, a funny cycle. Uh, but yeah, I'd be interested to see how Vernon goes. The thing with Quick Step is they have so, they do so many sort of 2 1 dot pro races that suit sprinters everyone gets an opportunity like hodge they did um again the american sports example benji it's like what you i don't think they got any money for it because cycling doesn't have trades but they kind of when a, a player's on the transfer block in the nba they give him more minutes to make him look better and then they tr- can transfer him for more money and they kind of hodge got a few good results and then he was out of there for uae do you think that's the thing we just saw with elon von Wilder? leaving DSM, technically mid-contract apparently, and as a consequence, the Koenig apparently having to pay a buyout for that. Do you think that's something that might happen a lot in the future, where we will see transfers actually happening instead of just 
contract sending and contract starting? Because then you could introduce stuff like trades in the future. It's something I'd love just from a, it'd give us a lot to talk about. And oh. I, I hope it does happen. And it makes it makes sense. Like you, we mentioned um, your Norwegian man, Johannesson. Like mm-hmm. if he signs a four-year deal to Uno X and that's taking him out till 26, well, to your point, what if he's what if he's top shelf at 24 and Ineos or Bora are like, we want this guy in? Maybe that's part of Uno X plan and they can negotiate transfer fees. I think – and Droni got a they, that's part of their business model <laughs> so <laughs> maybe that's why we're seeing more of these longer contracts for the young guys but Van Vilder's only on a two year deal at quick step uh, but my my last question was about the the alternatives ben, the alternative riders Benji the Zwifters but not all the Zwifters Zvihoff Palzer Vine Jason Osborne if i'm missing any i apologize who what are you expecting from the Bora experiment with those guys who had the Neo Pro this year? Zvihoff, I think, is a good domestique already at World Tour level and in Grand Tours. Pulsar, I, I personally think if Red Bull weren't involved, that wouldn't be happening still. Vine, I think, is obviously good. And Osborne, actually, I don't know, is it, is it quick step? He kind of looked all right in some of the all, other yeah. races he already did. Do you think other teams will want to – We'll see this and want to sign alternative guys from e racing or wherever. I think they might not be sold on the idea yet, and I think we need someone someone to really break through that barrier in the coming years to make sure that is shown. And I think Vine is definitely stepping up in that. In the Vuelta, he had that wonderful stage where people thought he couldn't descend, and then he uh, could descend until he touched the car, and then he suddenly uh, had an issue uh, technicality wise. But after that, descended very quickly to come back to the breakaway and try to win that stage got a podium there which is a great result on a Vuelta stage that you crashed on in the middle and a pretty hard crash as well so I think Vine uh, Vine's the real deal I think when it comes to Zvihov and Balzer they haven't lived up to the hype both of them in my eyes Zvihov you're right he's been a decent domestique but from the hype that they had I, I was expecting much more come on and when it comes to Osborne <laughs> that's the rider I do think that is going to be somewhat real as well because I think he started off with a decent prologue already. Yeah. The second that he joined uh, like, the yeah. quick step, I don't have my results in front of him, but I'm just looking forward to see him do more because he hasn't had many race days. But I think for now, it's just he's getting into it. And the problem there is that he's also already 27, and that's the counterpoint for me against that. And Not a problem for me. Yeah. Not a problem. He's He doesn't have the Ks in the legs. He was doing rowing. It's it's the same as the Woods Roglic transition. I don't see that as a problem for, okay. for his role, which is engine, right? That's that's who he is. Is he an engine? I th- I'm pretty sure. I th- I'm pretty sure <laughs> they want yeah choo choo train. They want him to be uh, an engine, and they can do that. Guys can do that till they're 45. Nah, 45 is a bit. Of, uh, I mean, till they're 40 on the flat. So I have a final final question <laughs> to finish it off. Which of the riders we named today? has the biggest opportunity to top five a Grand Tour in the coming five years. Ah, bring it down. Two years. Come on. <laughs> Come five on. <laughs> years. F- five years. So we win yeah. Grand Tours by then. Um, <laughs> to top, to, to podium, or do you say podium or top 10? Podium. Oh, yeah, that is. That is. You've got to be pretty good to podium Grand Tour. Definitely um, in two years. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, it's a really... It's between Plap, Pidcock. Are we talking the guys that just signed? Yes. Okay, then they get five years. I think Steinhauser, um, Steinhauser and Plap, the big ones. I don't see it. The Brooks, I don't see it. I think Johannesson's time trial is currently my weakness in him, that I don't see that happening. And therefore, I'm also. And he's on Unix, then I get sent to Grand Tours. <laughs> well, he's got five years. I got a fifth year is uh, the one where he's in a world 13. <laughs> Sure, you get the buyout, yeah. <laughs> uh, or he gets bought up, you're right, Androni style. But Plap is also the one I'm looking for here. But I also haven't seen enough to call him a, a GC god. So this is just a, a random call out for the future. I'm, I've got other riders that we named earlier that I'm looking forward to, like an Ayuso, like a Carlos Rodriguez for that. Uh, well, I did say Carlos Rodriguez top five at the Vuelta next year, didn't I? A few weeks I ago. I think Rodri- Rodriguez in the next three years is way more likely. Yeah, 
yeah, he's. I agree. Yeah, he's Do you see good. Hater as a GC guy? Sorry, I'm keep. I'm keep. <laughs> I'll keep on adding questions today. Uh, who is Ethan Hater? Let's see. I mean, what? I don't know. Have we seen him? He he did a very very sneaky program this year, didn't he? Like, there's not many long climbs in there, and. I need to see him on a thirty-minute climb or a stage with back with two thirty-minute climbs in it uh, to see how he'll go. I, I presume he'll get over the first one absolutely no problem. But how much time is he losing to top climbers on a mountain top finish is, is one to watch. But he is, you know, again like Plap, about five ten, five eleven, just under seventy kilos according to PCS. If he loses a bit more weight, like Thomas did, and got that tt already his tt is a lot a lock yeah he it, the ingredients are all there he's 23 so I, I wouldn't be surprised if they got him going too i mean depends on the parkour benji if you make a if aso decide to go back to 2012 and add 112 k's of flat time trialing <laughs> i mean any jumal and wout van Aert and hater they're all be licking their lips but uh it's not what we see at the moment with venue saying that tt Time gamed in TTs is not real time and only mountain time should count. So the Giro is going the other way. But let us know who you're excited about. Uh, we often struggle to follow the Conti scene or U23 scene during the season for obvious reasons. I've really enjoyed going and looking at all these signings. Who do you think will be the most world tour ready of these of these riders? Is, who, is miss? Something, who do we miss? I'm sure we missed other people. I've obviously thought, you know, someone like Mick van Dijk. Sheffield. Is, is world tour ready? Magnus Sheffield, another again, hey to plap Sheffield uh, engine guys. Um, but yeah, let us know down below. Thanks to Lacole for supporting the podcast and for Benji for preparing all that that list. Maybe we'll see these guys on his PCM videos next year. This year, mate, Johansson year. is trying to win the Tour de France right now. <laughs> That's why you're so high on him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's it's kind of funny because like the writers like Akovi and so forth, when I'm talking about them on the podcast, I think about them winning World Tour races in my <laughs> pro cycling manager team. I'm like, that's not the Kovi I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But bending bending reality. Maybe they've already won it on PCM. Maybe you need to win on Benji's PCM first before you can be legit. But thanks for, for listening and we'll see you later in the week. Ciao.